Assalamualaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Uh, we're here for our discussion for the Anatomy of Hate documentary screening. Uh, my name is Medina Pimadrago. I'm here on behalf of Cure New Jersey or the Council on American Islamic Relations New Jersey chapter, which is one of uh, the 35 chapters of our organization, which mission is to enhance the understanding of Islam, uh, promote mutual understanding, defend and protect Muslim Americans and empower us. Um, and we're America's largest Muslim civil rights and civil liberties advocacy group. Um, I'm here today and joined by our two esteemed panelists and guests. First, Professor Sahar Aziz. Um, so Aziz is a professor of law, a chancellor of social justice scholar, and Middle East and legal studies scholar at Rutgers University Law School. Her research investigates the relationship between authoritarianism, terrorism, and rule of law in the Middle East. She is the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Rutgers Center for Security, Race, and Rights, also known as CSRR, and a faculty affiliate of the African American Studies Department at Rutgers University North. Professor Aziz serves as the Rutgers North Chancellor Commission on Diversity and Transformation, as well as the editorial board of the Arab Law Quarterly and the International Journal of Middle East Studies. Professor Aziz teaches courses on national security, critical race theory, Islamophobia, evidence, torts, and Middle East law. Professor Aziz also has, ground, has a groundbreaking book um, titled The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom and examines how religious bigotry racializes immigrant Muslims through a historical and comparative approach. She has published over 30 academic articles and book chapters. Her articles are published in the Harvard National Security Journal, Washington and Lee Law Review, Nebraska Law Review, George Washington International Law Review, Penn State Law Review, and the Texas Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Journal. We also have with us our other esteemed panelists, Professor Jonathan Hafiz. Professor Jonathan Hafiz is an expert on constitutional law, national security, international criminal law, and transnational justice. He joined the Seton Hall Law School in 2010. Professor Hafiz is the author of the books Punishing Atrocities Through a Fair Trial, International Criminal Law, From the Newburgh to the Age of Global Terrorism, and habeas corpus after 9-11, confronting America's new global detention system, which received the American Bar Association's Civil, Silver Gavel Award for Media and the Arts, honorable mention in the American Society of Legal Writers Scribe Silver Medal Award. He is also the editor of Obama's Guantanamo Stories from an Enduring Prison, and the co-editor um, with Mark Dembio of the Guantanamo lawyers inside a prison outside the law. Professor Hafiz has testified before Congress and frequently provides expert commentary for major media outlets and news programs. He has lectured widely both in the United States and abroad, including in the United Kingdom, Belgium, Canada, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, Taiwan, Poland, Mexico, the Democratic Republic, and Haiti. In 2020, Professor Hafiz was named to the list of experts for international criminal law at The Hague. He has served as a consultant to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the Open Society Foundations. Thank you all so much. Um, and I'm really, really excited to have this amazing conversation today about this very heavy documentary that we all just watched um, about uh, the anatomy of hate. For those who are unfamiliar, The Anatomy of Hate was a documentary that explores, explores the definition of a hate crime through the evidence and events of the horrific triple murder in Chapel Hill on February 10, 2015. Um, so we're going to get right into this discussion. Um, I was able to watch this film, um, more so documentary, now three times and every time I watch it, I have a very visceral reaction, you know. Um, for you both, how do you feel? You know, what are your thoughts upon viewing the documentary? Well, I think 
uh, first of all, um, you just struck with the tremendous tragedy of what happened to uh, the victims and to their families, uh, loss that they can never uh, recover from. I mean, that, that you know, it just, it's just an incredible tragedy and, and totally just unnecessary that, that, you know, three young, talented uh, people lost their lives. Uh, and that, I think, is the first thing. It's just, it just a horrific event. And then I think it's just, the context is just very troubling about what happened to, uh, given the, uh, to, the, to these individuals, given uh, their religious, the, their religion and the, you know, the existing context of Islamophobia. I mean, that's it's another uh, level. Um, and the, and it, it doesn't seem like the legal system was, uh, really able to process this. It was simply they, they, there was you know, not enough evidence to, according to the federal government, to charge it as a hate crime, yet it, it, the, 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 even though the, the defendant received multiple life sentences, you just felt that, the, that justice was not fully served. The timing matters a lot of when this happened. It was 2015, and this was when Donald Trump was running for presidency, you know, very ex explicitly and overtly Islamophobic platform. He was saying statements such as Islam hates us, uh, we need to keep Muslims out, he's making his promises about what was yet to come in the Muslim ban, and he was doing it frequently. He was also attacking Obama as a secret Muslim, as someone who was disloyal, as someone who was a terrorist. And that had actually been going on for almost eight years because Donald Trump was also the leader of the Bertha movement, which was anti-black racism clothed in Islamophobia. Um, because Islamophobia was acceptable, I mean, you could effectively say clear, explicitly that if someone is Muslim, then they shouldn't be president, that they can't be president that it's almost a crime to be president. And that wasn't something that people took issue with. Instead, they took issue with the fact that, no, no, he's not Muslim, he's actually Christian. And therefore, the implication is he, he's not a bad person. Um, so what when I watched this documentary, and I remember when, these, when this case arose, I kept thinking, this is the cost that Muslims are paying for this pervasive and systematic this is the most egregious ex example and the most tragic, but there are so many other examples of people being harassed, being assaulted, being bullied in school, mosques being vandalized, in some cases being burned to the ground. And it just reminded me of how hate is not free. Somebody pays a cost for hate, and it's often not the speaker not the person who's perpetuating the hate, it's somebody else. Uh, and the other impression is, notwithstanding all of that backdrop, it still couldn't be imagined by the investigators, the police, the judge, the prosecutor, that this man may in fact have internalized the Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. That simply because he didn't ex articulate it explicitly, then a hate crime does not exist. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, the, 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 that interpretation of a hate crime privileges those who are not victims of hate crimes. That it privileges groups, males, white people, Christians, who are the least likely to be victims of hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And so how convenient it is that you require this explicit articulation as opposed to asking other questions like, well, if he had so much, if he had these longstanding disputes with his neighbors, about parking, why didn't he kill someone else? Why did he kill them? If he had complained about all these college students not following the rules, as we see in documentaries, why didn't he shoot them? And if you, if anyone who lives in the real world, especially in 2015, and especially if you look at his Facebook and you look at all the other evidence, he had absolutely internalized his own Thank you, too. The documentary alluded to points that you two both are raising um, with the parable. They talk about 
the two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning, how's the water, you know? Um, and the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks at the other and the other goes, what's water? Um, I found that to be a very powerful parable that was, you know, referenced in this documentary. Um, and like the point of the fish story, not merely just being about like, you know, an example, but the important realities that are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. And the fact that in this day-to-day -day trenches of, you know, the real world, um, there are life and death situations. Um, how do you think the implications of, you know, 9-11, the war on terror, and Islamophobia at large played a role in the execution of Brother Diaz Barakat and his sisters, um, and sisters uh, Yusur um, and Razan? Well, I think it's, uh, it's an excellent question and uh, very poignant the way the film points it out. I think it touches on a lot of what Sahar was saying about the way so much of the hatred uh, uh, and, and uh, animosity towards Muslims was had been internalized and it was not, um, and so the, the here you have something that was, it wasn't a, uh, I mean, it, you know, it was, it, it rose due to the situation of this dispute, but the, over the parking space, but all of this sort of this context that had been around in the United States, dating back to the, the start of the war on terror, the war in Iraq, and just the, you know, as you mentioned, with Donald Trump, and just the widespread Islamophobia was part of the context, it becomes part of uh, it explains kind of what happened. I think both what happened in terms of why uh, he murdered these three individuals, as well as the, the just the larger kind of context and reaction in the way that this happens, where you just have these three uh, you know, Muslim individuals murdered, and it just becomes part of that larger contra context of, kind of hatred, uh, and, and affects not the community as well. So I'll just emphasize what. Professor Hoppitz has said, which he contributed to trying to counter it in his own work in terms of the war on terror. Because we really can't underestimate, at that point it had been 14 years, now it's 21 years. But we really cannot underestimate just how harmful that entire mindset and, and social frame and political frame was for Muslims, because it put them where they constantly had to prove that they were innocent, mm -hmm. that they had to prove that they were not allied or sympathetic to terrorist groups, um, and that they had to prove that they belonged. Mm -hmm. I, when I heard the murderer's interview mm -hmm. in this documentary, it was clear that he didn't value them as humans. They were not humans to him, and that, comes from seeing scenes of people in Iraq, in Afghanistan, being killed as if they're just animals. And also showing only the pictures of militia groups and insurgent groups who are fighting their war against the United States Army, only showing those pictures of the natives, and not showing the pictures of civilians that are being murdered and who are so-called collateral damage. And we can't underestimate how much that over a 14 year period has a psychic effect that essentially just takes an entire group of people, and especially those that are most visibly Muslim, like the mm -hmm. women who are wearing the headscarf mm -hmm. uh, that could not pass as anything else, mm -hmm. as, okay, these people are not human. So any thing they did that would irritate or upset him, mm -hmm. it isn't going to be interpreted in the same way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the justice system really failed them because if we had investigators and police officers or prosecutors who understood that, they would have asked different questions. Mm -hmm. They, We don't know what they asked of the neighbors. We don't know, I mean, other than just saying, did you kill them because they're Muslim? Well, that's an easy question to, right. to respond and lie and just say no. But there are other, they're much more sophisticated, or capable of being more sophisticated in how they investigate the crime. The other 
component of it, which we saw in the documentary, was how the media covered it. And you know, the, the silver lining, it's tragic, but it is a silver lining, is this was one of the inflection points that predated the Muslim ban, which was the major inflection point, where almost all of kind of liberal America uh, that followed, for example, the Democratic Party or self-identifies liberal, that's the inflection point where people realize, wow, Islamophobia is real and it's strong and it's deep and it's entrenched. Mm -hmm. But before that, a lot of liberals really didn't see it as this systematic problem. They saw it more as, oh, well, it's a few bad apples, it's a few pe crazy people on the fringe of the right. It wasn't something they saw as normal or as mainstream. But this was the beginning of that shift because of the kind of cruelty with which he killed them. But the young Muslims started to use social media, Muslim Americans, mm -hmm. and you saw the hashtags Muslim Lives Matter, and why is this covered as a hate crime, and why is this being treated as a mere parking dispute, which effectively devalues their lives. It's like, oh, well, they're just a victim of a parking dispute. It's really tragic, too bad as opposed to this has absolutely nothing to do with the last 14 years. Uh, and I think that was something that at least put on the radar screen uh, Islamophobia in a larger sense, but it's just very sad that there's so much going on with Muslims. Thank you. You've raised a lot of points um, that I definitely want to get to um, throughout the Q&A um, Q and throughout the uh, moderation session. Um, I think it's you know important to amplify the victim's ethnic and racial identity in addition to their you know religious identity as Arab American Muslims, specifically of Syrian and Palestinian descent. You talk about you know the dehumanization um, of these groups um, on an international scale. How has the dehumanization of Palestinians and Syrians through the apartheid and occupation? impacted the gravity of these like you know murders in this specific case at large so I think that in the I don't know if the investigators prosecutors and government officials really understood the difference between a Syrian a Palestinian uh, an Arab a Pakistani in this particular case I think the identity fault line tended to be Muslim or non-Muslim. And in general, the way that this case was portrayed was very much about Muslim identity. And the, it was primarily those who are educated and informed about the different Arab identities and the way in which being a Syrian made you a, another type of problem which is the refugee threat, right, because this is also during the refugee crisis. And I don't know if people kind of connected that, but it is certainly not part of this media coverage. I mean, this is kind of coming back to the media coverage is, would, if this had been a different minority group who wasn't as vilified or who wasn't as disempowered, would there have been the backstory about how did they come to America, the life that they built in America, the conflict that they fled, I believe one of the families was from Iraq, right? mm -hmm. uh, and all of the challenges that they had to overcome and the way that they played by the rules, followed the laws, going to dental school. Um, in addition, if one of the families appears to be Palestinian, what was their story? So there's very little human humanization and that is something that is indicative or it's not just with this family, but that is really important when you're trying to de-otherize because you must dehumanize. And so the question I always pose to my students is compare that to um, a member of a privileged group in whatever context you choose. And if the same thing had happened, how would the media have covered? How would people have seen this as part of a bigger social drama? Or would they just compartmentalize and say this is just an unfortunate tragedy and you know it's, it's, it's very sad but there's really nothing we can do about it rather than putting it in the broader context and go actually there is something.
This is part of Amy Lynch. I want to, um, Dr. Um, Professor Hopkins, I, I want to ask you, um, I know you have a lot of experience in like, you know, criminal law, um, which like for the most part also bleeds over into like hate crimes, bias crimes and things of that nature. Why is the burden of proving a hate crime so difficult? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's challenging because, I mean, it, it's always challenging that the prosecution always bears a heavy burden, and for, you know, good reasons. I mean, we want to protect defendants' rights. But I think, uh, well, I think, you know, one, and um, here, to try to prove what the, the motive was, that this was the reason, that was the, you know, this was the reason that uh, religion uh, or hatred toward, hatred towards Muslims or African Americans was a reason that he killed these three individuals. Uh, but on the, you know, so that's challenging to prove. On the other hand, I think, as Professor Aziz pointed out, it's uh, you know, it, a lot of the answers come from some of the questions and the way they probed. And you know, you had very kind of self-serving statements of the defendant uh, who you know, uh, not admitting that he was biased, that he did it just over the parking space. So I think you know, it's, it's questionable whether they. I, I certainly think that the prosecution, well, the, yeah, the federal prosecution where there was a hate crime statute. Uh, had a, I mean, it was certainly challenging, right? I mean, there was not, um, you know, there was no smoking gun here that they could point to. On the other hand, I think there were, you know, there were avenues they could have looked at in terms of trying to demonstrate the, the way that bias and implicit bias affected uh, the defendant's actions. Thank you. It's really, it's really um, difficult and it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, Professor Aziz, um, you are the author of this very powerful book, The Racial Muslim, uh, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom. Very, very powerful book. I wanna ask you, how do we support social justice causes without co-opting the language of other movements and struggles? In the film, I noticed the mention of Muslim Lives Matter, which is like a play on Black Lives Matter. You know, as a Black Muslim, um, as a person who identifies as, you know, racially black and then also religiously Muslim, how do we have these discussions without, you know, unintentionally co-opting language, unintentionally stepping on other movements' toes? Because it's necessary to, you know, state that, you know, Muslims do matter, but we don't want to do it in the way that alienates or seeks to diminish the struggle specifically geared towards um, our black brothers and sisters? Well, there are many challenges in the progressive social circles that are, I think, rooted more internally and can be, as a result, controlled by people in those groups. And the, the first one is to not be in the mindset of a zero-sum game where you get social justice that takes from my social justice. Mm -hmm. And the second is that we shouldn't, as an extension of that, play what they call the uh, oppression Olympics. Mm -hmm. Again, competing to see who's more oppressed than the other. And when you fall into those two traps, you effectively allow the system to uh, do very little in order for you not to succeed because you can just self-destruct. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the implosion rather than external attack. And I think that is something that people within these movements can make those intentional decisions by giving other groups the benefit of the doubt, by assuming good faith, uh, and also by not uh, perceiving, again, the zero-sum game. So for example, I do not see the hashtag Muslim Lives Matter as necessarily saying that therefore black lives don't matter that black lives don't matter as much. It's really more of saying Muslims are other as are blacks, and then we can have an analysis of the different ways and the different degrees which way the Muslim lives or black lives are effectively dehumanized and devalued. But I don't think that it is necessarily a, a zero-sum game, and that I think is just more um, uh, a consequence of are segregated societies. I mean, I think that one of the fundamental, if you really want to go to the root cause of many of our social justice challenges, it's segregation. 
physical segregation. We don't live with each other. We don't go to school with each other. We don't go to houses of worship with each other. We don't socialize with each other. We don't marry each other. And when I mean each other, right, then just look at the different groups, whether it's along racial lines, whether it's along ethnic lines, class lines. And as a result, it's so easy then to manipulate groups to see each other as competition, and especially when those groups are oppressed. Because then you're dealing with scarcity, and you're dealing with the internalization of oppression, and that if we're not even seeing, you can't never underestimate how powerful it is to cause, to produce oppression by making the oppressed internalize their oppression. Because then they become the soldiers of your oppression. I always use the term, the, the example of patriarchy. In many places around the world, when you identify patriarchal norms and patriarchal practices, and then you kind of dig deeper and go, who's actually implementing them? Who's enforcing them? A lot of times it's the women. It's the women that are enforcing them on other women. And without that, the patriarchy would collapse. <clears throat> And so we have to think along those lines when we're talking about intergroup, especially inter-subordinated group dynamics, when we're thinking about um, you know, uh, intra-group dynamics. So unfortunately, it is the burden is on those communities to be intentional and to not fall into those traps, but at the same time be constructive. And if it gets to the point, because you know, I do think it's, it's fair to say that there are contexts where, for example, when you talk about lynching, right? if you were to use a hashtag that says, lynched Muslims matter, that I think would be a pretty direct affront to African American mm -hmm. communities because the facts are, are the, it's, it's fact, empirically true, the vast majority of people who have been lynched have been black. Right? It is a crime, it is a terror crime against black communities. Now that doesn't mean that you won't find examples of non-blacks being lynched, you absolutely will. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes it's because they're mistaken for black or because they're associating with blacks. And so I think in that context, that can be very um, harmful. Mm -hmm. but, but in the case of, for example, Muslims Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, I certainly didn't see it. But again, I have, you know, I'm coming from a position of being a Muslim and not being black. Mm -hmm. But if somebody were to, for example, say, anti-Semitism is real, I don't see that as an affront to Islamophobia. It's like, of course anti-Semitism is real. I don't believe that if someone is fighting against anti-Semitism, that that is in some way eroding or compromising efforts to combat Islamophobia. I like the point. I will push back just a little, um, only because I think it's important to understand the context as to why specific language is created to the say her name hashtag specifically for you know black women you know black femmes black girls killed by police brutality um, and the erasure of those specific communities um, as pertains to that specific um, struggle as we know like when police brutality matters happen oftentimes it's very much centered around black men mm -hmm. black boys similarly with the hashtag black lives matter it's not like to say like all lives don't matter but in like until black lives matter all lives can't matter or it's not to say that you know muslim lives don't matter which they do but it's the importance of deferring to the community that created the language and ensuring that we don't co-op the language that was specifically utilized for a specific purpose now if they said justice for dia you know justice for Razan, justice for, you know, um, you, sir. I think it would have been appropriate. So let me push back a yes. little. I, I think there's a different context that your argument isn't taking into account. And I absolutely agree with you that, especially when you're dealing with police violence, mm -hmm. um, again, similar to the lynching example, African Americans, particularly, or black men and black women, have been uh, disproportionately harmed and killed. But it's, when, when I saw the hashtag Muslim Lives Matter, I was not thinking about that context. I was thinking about the war on terror. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the way that our military didn't even value the lives of Iraqi civilians, didn't value the lives of Afghan civilians or Yemeni civilians, the way that our government supported dictatorships who had essentially 
um, counter a revolution, he had a counter revolution or coups against the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I saw Muslim Lives Matter, and this was, a, a, this was the context was different, but it was the fact that these people are just disposable. Mm -hmm. Just like they're disposable in our imperialistic wars, they're disposable in our criminal justice system. Um, and so are black lives, mm -hmm. but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And so it's fascinating that that, yeah. that was not the, the way I interpreted yeah. Muslim Lives Matter. I mean, I certainly saw the connection, yeah. but because of the timing, and we were in 2015, mm -hmm. and it was still, the, the war on terror was alive, yeah. and that's the context where Islamophobia is it's very much connected. Just like you can't really understand anti-black racism without understanding the legacies of slavery, and the, the backlash against Reconstruction, and the Jim Crow era, and the Civil Rights Movement, and so a lot of it, and, and I understand that I have a unique situation because I'm an academic, so yeah. I know all that history, yeah, yeah. and a lot of the public may not know it, um, so I'm probably the wrong person <laughs> <laughs> to, to ask on that, but but I but I take your point. Yeah. I totally Thank take you. your point. You. The question is, how can you, and I think this is a real challenge, because I think if black communities and Muslim communities and black Muslim communities, yeah. again, were working together more and we were so segregated, I think a lot of these conversations can be had in ways where it may be that the consensus is, let's not use Muslim Lives Matter, let's use another hashtag. Mm -hmm. Or it may be the consensus is, no, this actually is perfectly legitimate because you're, you, it, it, there, are, there are millions of people getting killed, there are hundreds of thousands of Muslim lives getting killed. Uh, and we now understand that that doesn't take away, or that doesn't undermine or dismiss or discount right, the very real problem of police brutality uh, of, of, against black communities for centuries. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, well taken. Um, I know we had a conversation, Professor Abbott, about the media um, and how the executions and murders being amplified as an issue about parking disputes. Do you believe, from a legal standpoint, the implications of that original reporting impacted the sentencing verdict? And you know how oftentimes when there is a trial and juries are um, you know, implicated, uh, judges will uh, execute gag orders for the press and the media, um, juries uh, won't be informed of jury nullification and things of that nature. Um, not entirely sure if th there was a jury in this case, but how do you think the media might have played out in this ruling um, in the verdict? Yeah, it's hard to tell from the you know from the video. I guess I, I mean I have just a couple thoughts. I think certainly the media affected the overall context. I think and the reporting about it and how it was perceived by the public and the community. I mean he did plead guilty, it appears, and so there was no trial. And, and there, I, you know, whether. I, you know, it's, it's uncertain what, you know, what the motivation for the judge was mm -hmm. in not um, referencing it in his remarks and when he handed out the, the most severe sentence. But, I mean, it may have been, there was no uh, hate crime statute. So, um, uh, so in, in, you know, that, that he would, could have been charged under. So that may have been it, and, uh, you know, it's, it's uncertain why. I mean, I think, you know, he, he might have been able to say, uh, something without creating any kind of ground for appeal to recognize that. One of the, uh, but one of the things that you know strikes me about the uh, um, overall the, the kind of impact is the importance of the, you know the importance of, of hate crimes and what it means to the to victims and to the community and the larger society, right? I mean, he, the defendant was sent you know he was sentenced to three consecutive life uh, three life sentences, right, without parole. So there's no question he's you know he had the most you know severe prison sentence possible, he's never going to see freedom again, and yet it's very important that crimes be recognized and labeled for what they are, and that, that, some, that there be some way that the uh, anti-Muslim bias or animus uh, or hatred have, have been recognized legally, and then why that's so important. I mean, we can see that in, uh, we talk about in, like in international law a lot, where you have, it's very important to victims that certain crimes be labeled Correctly, not just murder, but genocide, for example, right? So that the, the haters kind of recognize, even though from a, a, a purely utilitarian 
perspective, it doesn't matter. I mean, it wasn't, as, as a documentary noted, this per uh, person's sentence couldn't have been any longer. It's not, it wouldn't have affected the actual jail time, but it has a, a very significant social and public resonance. So I think that's a very important uh, aspect of, the, of, the, of, of hate crimes and, the, and that's surfaced by the documentary. Yeah, that's, that's so important to, to understand. And like from a person, not from a legal perspective, it, oftentimes like you know when I see these things play out I'm like how can you not see it how can you not see it but I think a lot of times though you know average lay person doesn't understand that the way in which the law is executed mm -hmm. and the way in which the law is performed is very different than how we see it on you know shows like how to get away with murder or like you know scandal and things of that nature it's not the same um, Thank you. So currently, you know, in my capacity, um, officially I work for CARE New Jersey as their government affairs manager. And I essentially handle their advocacy, public policy, um, and legislative portfolio. Like my job is to, you know, engage with lawmakers, to um, inform the community um, on civic engagement types of matters, to help, you know, push their public policy agenda. And one of our legislative priorities is actually um, a defining Islamophobia a piece of legislation. Um, and you know, it's a piece of legislation that we get a lot of pushback on. Um, and what I'm finding out in our advocacy and legislative efforts is that it's very difficult to define Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Or for a lot of people, they are uncomfortable by the term Islamophobia. There's um, conversations about whether we should drop Islamophobia and move toward anti-Muslim bias. Um, there's conversation about what does Islamophobia actually entail? Is it too broad? Is it too narrow? Um, some people uh, discuss the uncomfortability with definitions being put in any type of legal statute as it pertains to protections um, for hate crimes. What are your thoughts on this? And, and how do you encourage advocates and public policy makers and government affairs professionals to pursue these types of um, policy changes with such a, a intricate topic like Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bias? Those are all fair questions. I think the most important one is what we are really, what's the meaning rather than what's the terminology. Uh, even in among scholars of prejudice against Muslim bias, against Muslim hate, against Muslim Islamophobia, there is a debate about, should we call it anti-Muslim racism, mm. or should we call it Islamophobia? Mm. And in fact, my book, <laughs> The Racial Muslim, explains that difference in, you know, kind of gives a literature review and then explains the, the differences. And it's literally speaking, Islamophobia is the fear of Islam the fear of people who follow Islam. And therefore, it is quite broad because then the manifestations of that fear can be quite capacious from hate crimes to workplace discrimination to um, pub uh, public assault, uh, etc. Anti-Muslim racism is much more about the people. I mean, people who are Muslim or who are perceived as Muslim, and then it is anything that is against them, harms them, adverse to them, because of their Muslim identity or perceived Muslim identity. And that, I think, is, at least from a legal perspective, much cleaner and much more specific because it is about the people. And when you are dealing with civil rights, you're talking about harms to people, or people's property, right, or people's privacy. And so it's always connected to individuals, you know, one or a group. Whereas Islamophobia is, I think, a better uh, description of political phenomena mm -hmm. that produce anti-Muslim racism. Right? Then you get into the debate of, well, racism is about a race, it's not about a religion, and mm -hmm. going back to the book, The Racial Muslim. And I think that kind of misses the point of, that's where you're getting into just discursive trivialities of what is it a race, is it ethnicity, is it religion, it doesn't matter what it really is, it matters how they're treated. So the same thing when you talk about anti-Semitism. Right? So are Jews merely a religious group or are they actually more like a racial group or an ethnic group? 
Well, literally speaking, they're a religious group. Okay? But if you look historically at the way that they were treated by Eastern Europe and Western Europe, um, you will find that in the United States, but especially in the Western world, they're very much treated as if they are their own racial category. And it's not in any way related to how they look. Because right? there's Sephardic, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi Jews that look very different, uh, Ethiopian Jews, right? And it's not related to how religious they are because there's people who are very secular and then people who are very orthodox. And I think the same analogy could be used for the social construction of Muslim identity mm -hmm. in, in that regard. Now, of course, with Muslims, well, similar to Jews, but I think even on a wider scale, you have, because it literally is 1.8 billion people from across the entire globe, mm -hmm. you have every single possible phenotype. Mm -hmm. Right, so the spectrum of phenotypical difference is much broader, mm -hmm. uh, but so I, and then the question is, well, why don't we just use anti-Semitism as the template? With one exception, right, and this is where I'll take issue with the International Holocaust Remembrance Act's definition that unfortunately I think really does harm to real anti-Semitism by defining it as criticism towards a nation state. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly in nation states, human rights and civil rights records, and in this case, it's Israel. But if you were to apply that same model or template to Muslims, well, that would then mean that if you criticize Egypt's human rights record, if you criticize Saudi Arabia's, Iran's, and there's over 30 Muslim majority countries, that every time, and some of them, like Saudi Arabia and like Iran, are openly, explicitly Muslim countries. They say, we are a Muslim country not just a Muslim-majority country, mm -hmm. just like Israel claims to be a Jewish country, even though Israel is a secular state. Mm -hmm. And it was built on secularism and secular liberal principles. It actually was not built on theological Jewish Orthodox principles if you look at their entire legal system. Um, so being a Jewish state, again, is really more about an ethnic identity than it is about the theological um, principles. Whereas even in Saudi Arabia and Iran, they say, no, it's based on the theological, the Shia the Sunni version. Mm -hmm. And surely we do not want to have a criticism of those states' human rights records to be mistaken or conflated with anti-Muslim racism. Mm -hmm. And you think about the First Amendment implications, the political freedom implications, if the human rights implications of even our own ability to combat human rights by whomever the perpetrators are against whomever the victims are. So I think that's where we have a lot, we can learn a lot from anti-Semitism, and I think it's also an opportunity to both kind of clean up that definition of anti-Semitism. So we're really focused on discrimination against Jews because they're Jews, and also focus on discrimination against Muslims because they're Muslim and they're perceived to be both Jews. Thank you. So, Professor Hafez, yes, I welcome your insights. No, I agree, I mean, those are, you know, I, I, yeah, very accurate, important points. I mean, I, I think uh, I would only, yeah, I would add just two brief things. One, I mean, I just, at least and I agree with your legal analysis uh, about anti-Muslim racism and why that's cleaner. Um, and I think just Islamophobia as a descriptive matter just has a certain, just given the particular post 9-11 context, there's something about it as a descriptive matter, but I think it's, you know, legally speaking, the anti-Muslim uh, racism is, 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 is cleaner and a more accurate way to, uh, to move forward. And I just agree completely with uh, your point about it's very you know, harmful to, um, or, or risky to conflate criticism of a state with a bias toward that particular group, whether it's criticism of Israel necessarily means uh, 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 anti-Semitism or criticism of, as you mentioned, right, you know, Saudi Arabia, Iran, states that have prob very problematic human rights records would be anti-Muslim. I think that's very problematic. It's just, just shores up. I think really, you know, kind of right wing, uh, uh, right wing policies and governments that are opposed to equality, civil liberties. I mean, this is certainly an issue for Israel now. I think where it's a very, uh, uh, a very important turning point in terms of the Netanyahu government and, and emphasis to kind of move, try to move Israel away from its uh, uh, further away from its original secular roots and power uh, other groups within side and undercut the Supreme Court. So I think it's a very trenchant point to make at this. Thank you so much. I just want to close off um, with some final words from you both brilliant individuals. This was such a fruitful conversation.
I found this documentary to be extremely powerful. I know in our communities, um, it's very much not recommended to talk about our trauma, to talk about our grief, to, to relive these types of experiences. But, you know, it takes a specific type of courage for the family of these victims to do so. What would you want to leave um, this discussion saying about this event and how to move forward from this type of brutality and, and, and how the Muslim community can continue to move forward in light of all of this terrible um, things that have happened? I think when I watched this documentary, I thought the biggest blessing they have is their faith. Mm. And I just thought about how I can't imagine getting through something that tragic if you're not Christian, whatever your faith is. And, and how that is truly when, at least let's say in this context, being a Muslim is a blessing. Uh, because I mean, if you believe that there is the day of judgment, you believe that there is a heaven and you believe that you're on earth for a limited time to do good and that uh, you know, God's will, God has a reason for everything. And, and prayer is, is very therapeutic and, and rejuvenating. Um, so I, I think I just kept thinking about how uh, I think all of us, at least I mean, there is a saying I was taught when I was in in my family, and I don't know if it's an official hadith or if it's more just family wisdom, uh, but it was claimed to be, you know, had religious origins, which is that oftentimes one of the one of the lessons or one of the consequences of seeing suffering is to appreciate your own health or your own life mm -hmm. or your own fragility, and that sometimes you have to understand that when people die, that it's also an opportunity for you to think more about life and death and the meaning of your life and, and how fragile your life is and to really put things into perspective um, and that that is part of uh, the, the purpose of being on this earth you know, from, a, from an Islamic perspective. So it, it, is, it is a tragedy, but at the same time, I think if you have faith, you know that this life is ephemeral. ephemeral. Yeah, and I, I just, I mean, I, I'm still in awe of the uh, parents and the other family members to be able to go on screen and relive this and have the, the you know, kind of deal with the trauma, um, profound trauma, greatest trauma of every, you know, losing children. I mean, and so, and to be able to try to make something positive for their, you know, the remaining family members for themselves and for the larger community. So, um, I, and certainly I think they've, uh, uh, played a role. Uh, I mean, nonetheless, I think it's uh, you know it's a, it's very inspiring uh, uh, to see that, and try you know certainly uh, I'm in awe that they were able to do that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight with us. This was a impactful and powerful conversation with these two brilliant legal scholars and legal minds, and I hope you two will continue to fight this good fight. Um, and I hope you all will continue to be allies in the struggle um, and will, you know, continue to do research on these topics and care about these topics. And by our professor's amazing book, The Racial Muslim. Thank you so much, everyone. Zakwa Kaidan, Salaam.